everybody. Mike here with So For Less. And uh, guys, I'm really excited about today. Today is a little bit of a departure from what we normally do. This is kind of a bonus show. But again, a very special show today for you guys. Of course, I'm joined by none other than the amazingly talented and super creative Donna McAdams. Uh, she's going to be demonstrating some pretty amazing tools that she's created to conquer those pesky borders and corners that all too often get put aside and procrastinated. And I'm going to tell you guys, once you see just how easy she can make it, I guarantee you, you guys are going to grab some of those UFOs that might be on the cutting table or in the closet. And I bet you we're going to see some of those finished. So I uh, wanted to get a couple of things out of the way before we get started. Of course, uh, you know, if you've watched any of our Friday shows, that I'm joined by none other than Joe, our master keyboardist and commenter extraordinaire. So a uh, quick round of applause for Joe. Yeah. Uh, but we are streaming in three different locations today. So you might be joining us on Facebook, on YouTube, or on SoForLess.com, which is kind of a rarity. We don't normally stream uh, to SoForLess.com, but super excited to be there. And it's it's actually probably the most convenient place to be. Uh, of course, you can comment on any of those platforms, even on the website. Um, but we're excited for anybody to join in wherever you're most comfortable watching. Uh, again, we have organized everything on the website to make it a little bit more convenient. Uh, Joe, if you don't mind, so I'm going to have Joe put a link into the comments to get you to the website if you want to try that. And the reason that that is probably a little bit more convenient it's because Donnell is going to be showcasing six different tools that she created today, and they're going to be available for purchase, obviously, and it's going to be right below the live stream. So it is probably the most convenient place to be. You can always go back there afterwards if you wanted to continue watching on YouTube or on Facebook, uh, but it will be the most convenient place to be. Uh, again, continue watching wherever you're most convenient. We are on Facebook, we are on YouTube, and we are streaming live on the website as well today. Uh, again, you'll be able to comment on all of those platforms. So we'll be able to uh, read your comments. If you guys have any questions, uh, we'll be addressing them in near real time. We don't want to interrupt Donna if she's in the middle of something. Uh, but we do recommend that you wait to shop until after the show is over. Uh, this way you don't miss any of the video. You can go back and rewatch it as well. Uh, if you do happen to navigate away, and of course this just depends on where you're watching it at, but uh, chances are if you hit a, a, a product and you navigate away from the show, if you click on a product, just click on the back button, either on your phone or you know your tablet or your computer, and it should get you back to the live feed. You may have to refresh the page. If you just happen to completely close out of everything, the fastest way to get back to the show is just to navigate back to the SoForLess.com website. Uh, the reason I say that is that on the top of every page of the website is a link to the live stream. So we've tried to make it just as easy as possible. Um, if you are on Facebook and you wanted to do it that way, you can go through uh, either the SoForLess live group or our SoForLess Facebook page. So a lot of different ways to find us. Uh, we try to make it just as convenient as possible. But again, guys, easiest way to do it is just to go to the SoForLess.com website and click on that link on the top of every page on the website. Uh, Joe, did you did you post that link yeah. for me? Okay, perfect. Great. Um, I have a little cheater script that I wrote for uh, the show, so I'm kind of referring back to that right now. But so if you are watching on the SoForLess.com uh, website, as I mentioned, we do have the live chat. It's available underneath the live video feed. Uh, the live chat means that, you know, you can ask your questions in real time directly to Donnell. And we will work best to get those questions answered live. Uh, it is definitely the best part of a live class, the interactivity. Uh, and again, guys, don't be shy. Uh, just to get everybody started and familiarized with the commenting, commenting system, I'll go ahead and get everybody started. So uh, I'm curious, where is everybody watching from? Where are you watching from right now? Could be at the pool. Uh, you could be uh, at a lunch meeting. It could be wherever. I'm just kind of curious, where are you watching from right now? Of course, we're live from the Sofa Less Studios and Donnell is in Indiana. So if you happen to end up back on YouTube, as I mentioned, because if you click on the live link, uh, you will not see the items underneath the live feed, so you'll have to go ahead and head back to the SoForLess.com 
website. Guys, cool thing about today, all of the items that you see featured on the show, we have went ahead and included free shipping on any of those products. So uh, even if it's just uh, the ruler or whatever it is, if you see something that you like, all of those items do have free sew and saver shipping right now. Uh, so it's a, a great way to take advantage of, save a little bit more. And uh, yeah, so yeah, there, there you go. Perfect. Joe, I see Joe just put that up on the banner. Uh, we don't use StreamYard very often, so we're a little bit new to this, but uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. But um, Joe, did you think, did I miss anything? I think that about got it, yeah. Well, I know everybody's here for Donnell and not for me, so we're going to hood and we're going to get my mug off of the uh, the screen here. And we're going to go ahead and get Donnell on there. Um, Donnell, uh, if you're ready, let's get it going. There you go. All right. Well, I want to welcome everyone to my sewing studio. And today we're going to have a lot of fun. I'm going to show you on actual project projects how to use these particular tools. So I have just kind of mocked up here. It's a cheater piece of fabric. Don't tell anyone. But I have quilted it so that I'm going to be using this center part here. This nine patch is going to be what I want to see when I'm completely finished with it. So pretty much it's, it's just a matter of what I've got here is just a sample. I've got my batting. I have got the top here and I've got my backing. So I quilted it just like I would do a tic-tac-toe board. You can see here on the back what that looks like. It's just as if it were a tic-tac-toe board. And when I finish, I want to have my binding right at these side points and right up here, top and bottom. So with the tool that I'm going to be using, you can do a lot of different things. Today, I'm going to use it how it's written in the instructions. And I'm going to show you these instructions because all of my tools have picture instructions. Yes, they have words, but they also have pictures because I'm a picture person. I'll read the words if I have to, but I'd rather just look at the pictures. So you can see that when you get this tool, you are going to be able to use those photographs. Now, the first one is the very first tool that I... Um, I don't know whether you say designed or whatever, but actually I guess it is designed. And it is the quick, easy mitered binding tool. Now looking back, some of these names are like, oh my gosh, how do we, we keep all of those straight? Well, I named it for what it was. It's quick and easy and it's gonna miter your binding. So it's pretty much the name says it all. So when I first started teaching this method, we were using little um, file folder corners and, you know, all kinds of different things. And then I finally decided, hey, if all of my people in my store are using this, I might as well get this to be a product. So that was clear back in 2005. And we are still the only one that has a tool like this. So what we need to do on this particular piece is we need to cut out a three and a three fourths inch from that spot where I said I wanted it to finish. So I want my batting and my backing to be three fourths of an inch larger all the way around. So I've got my cutting board underneath here. So I'm going to fold this piece back and I'm going to fold that backing underneath because I don't want to cut it. And now I'm going to use a ruler that's long enough to get that three-fourths of an inch. So if I just come right in here, that's at three-fourths of an inch right there. And so all in one cut, we're going to just cut that right off. Now, while I'm here, I need to just go ahead and cut this an inch and a half, which is double the distance, and you'll want to remember that little technique when you're doing something else. And so now I need an inch and a half. So let's just turn the ruler around and make this real easy so that I put it right on that line there. Nope, right on the edge. And we're just going to cut this so it's an inch and a half longer. 
Now, if you wanted to go all the way around with the three fourths first and then come back and do the inch and a half, you can certainly do that. Sometimes that's the safest for me because I got my mind on so many things. I can't keep it straight. So let's just go ahead here and do three fourths. Turn this back. And we're coming from here, three fourths. You know, the old rule is measure twice, cut once. Sometimes for me, I have to measure three times or so. So there that's cut off. And then we're going to come around here, making sure that's clear back there. Now you might not have this much to cut off. You might only have just a little bit, but since I was making this so that I wanted that to finish right up around here, I have all that extra. So now's when I'm coming in with my inch and a half. inch and a half and I have one more side here so I now have this ready to do the technique now I like to give a lot of hints when I'm working with uh, teaching different proje projects and products and so one that I'm going to give you you may not be an actual quilter you may be one that does all kinds of placemats and, you know, whatever, but maybe you don't actually quilt. In other words, put a needle and thread in and make stitches or do ruler work or free motion or anything like that. I want to tell you, if you use batting, one of the things that you always want to do is check to see that you have the right side of the batting up. So when you do that, the easiest way is to take that one side and take a sharp straight pin and just dab at it like that. And if it dents down and doesn't want to go through, that's the wrong side of the batting. Test the other side. And this one, you can see it went, well, it didn't go right there, but right here, it's just going right through there. Okay, so if when you take that sharp pen and you see a resistance, that's the wrong side. And why is that important? Well, when we're stitching, if the needle will go down, whether it's a hand needle or a machine needle, will go down into it easier, it's always going to come back up. So you may not have been aware that there's a right side and a wrong side to battings. So that's just a little extra hint there. Now, once we've got this like that, what I need to do is do a little pressing. So I'm going to pull my wool mat over here. And I know Mike has these at Sew for Less. You may already have one. But I'm going to use my wool mat here. And I'm simply going to turn what I cut extra in to touch this edge. So I'm just going to use my little iron here. And if you've never used a wool mat, they just reflect the heat right back up into your fabric. So it just makes your pressing that much easier. Now, when you're doing this, you don't want to just start like at this end and then just push your iron that way because it will end up doing this at the end. It will kind of flare out. I usually put it right in the center and press that and then get it lined up on one end or the other and hold it in place and then just take my hand to that direction. So I've got this. And it's much better to press than it is to actually iron.
Now we've Donnell, got one. are you able to hear me? I certainly am. So we did have a question come through, uh, and of course, they love the fabric. And what they were wondering was, where can they purchase the fabric? <laughs> um, I will put it up on my website, which is sobizmarion.com. It's not up there right now, but I will. I just went in the back and pulled some of a bolt off and put it on. And so we do have plenty of it that we can sell. So again, I've now pressed that in so that all of those edges are turned in half. And I'm just gonna set this aside again to give us more room. So now, we are going to use the tool and that's what it looks like. It will come to you like this with a piece of paper on the back. And you're just going to take a little straight pin on the corner because you can hardly get your fingernail under there. And once you start peeling, if you peel this slowly, it'll come off very easily. So that's just a little hint because all of my tools are this signature some people call it yellow. I think it looks like it's green, but you know, whatever. It's nice and bright and you can find it. So now what we're going to be doing, and I'm going to show you other things later with the same tool, but I'm showing you just the basics right now. So the tool has reference lines. This is the corner of your project. So any size of project, this is the corner. It doesn't have to be a big tool for a big quilt. This is the corner. So I lay that right on that corner. And then I'm gonna take either a marker of some kind or a pencil. I'm gonna use a Frixon marker because this is my fine line. And I'm just gonna go right along this edge here. You see that? I'm coming back and I'm going to make a line where the line crosses in the fold. So I just come around to this corner, make that line where the line crosses in the fold. And I'm going to address in just a moment what would happen if you have like points that stop at a quarter of an inch. For example, if you had a flying goose in that outer edge or you had a half square triangle or something like that, I'll show you all about that. Now my thread, I'm using a red so you're gonna be able to see it so that it will be um, easy for you to see how we do this. So the next step, you're just gonna take your fabric, I just like to turn my project over and pull this back so that you're making that into a point at the corner. And the whole idea is that intersection spot right there needs to be aligned with that one right there. So the easiest way to do that is to get a straight straight pin, not a crooked straight pin, That's a funny there. So hopefully some of you at home laughed. And when this goes through, if you picked a smart pen, it went right through. Mine's just a little below smart. And so now I took it back out and I put it right back where it's supposed to go. And now I'm gonna pull that down flat, hold my thumbnail there and my fingernail on the back and pull my pen back and put that in place like that. So I'm gonna do this corner So we, we did have another question. Kathy was asking, can you use this tool on a binding that you are sewing onto the edge of your quilt? Nope, this is all for bringing the back to the front or the front to the back. The tool I would recommend for what she's asking is the Bound to Fit tool by Sew Steady. It's the perfect tool for doing an add-on binding it actually looks like this. And I use it for joining my binding. 
it will actually give you these perfect diagonals with the dog ear off so that these will match up. And it also allows you that when you come back, you can join them so that they match up on the diagonal. So that's called the bound to fit tool. The reason I designed this tool was because way back in the day, I had been asked by one of the magazines, it's not even available anymore, to do a table setting. And I had to make 12 placemats and a table runner using a border print. Oops, I forgot to mark those. So anyway, I was like, oh my gosh, I do not want to do an add-on binding on 12 placemats and a table runner. I don't like to do an add-on binding if I don't have to at all. So that's when I came up with this tool so that you can do these very quickly. I'll have them done while you're making that two and a half inch binding. With that all said, I am going to tell you there are some quilts that need the add-on binding. There are some projects that when they're made, the only option is the add-on binding. So you're gonna have need for both, but in a lot of your projects, baby quilts, um, placemats, that kind of thing, you're gonna be able to save a ton of time by doing the add-on binding and bringing the back to the front. So now what I'm gonna do is, I am going to be starting closest to the fold in the middle and I'm gonna come forward. I like to just pick it up and pivot and go back, but if you wanna back stitch, you can, but you're gonna be starting and stopping right in the middle. We do not sew this part of it. So you're going to stop at your pen. And I don't sew over pens. So I'm going to definitely make sure. So I came forward. And now I'm going to reverse. Well, I thought it was going to go in reverse. Nope, didn't want to do that. So let me, I guess I've got it on the wrong setting for that. Here we go. So let's just do that one more time. Come to the end and stop. And like I said, I like to just pivot it around if it's a smaller project, because that way I can see coming to this corner. So I'm right there. So I'm gonna leave my needle down and pick up that foot and pivot again. Now, after you get used to this, you can do the reverse and that will be just fine. Now, like I said, I'm using red thread so you can see what I've done here. Now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using some regular scissors, shears, and cutting that off and then just cutting this point. So we're going to go to the next one. This one I will reverse so you can see me do that. Come right to that edge, leave the needle down, and then touch the reverse and go right back to that pen. And then come back forward and you can go ahead and cut that. Now I did not sew over the pen, I stitched right up to it. So we've got one more here. And I'm going to again go in reverse. I always slow down when I'm getting to that pen. Because like I said, I need to stop there and I really don't want to stitch over it. Keep that good and flat so that it's stitching right on the line that you drew. All right.
so now you can see I've kind of made this upside down little bowl, but all I need to do is take either my finger or a point turner, and I'm just gonna take that and push that back down in there, turning out that point. Don't use anything sharp because you don't wanna push that on through and have a hole in there. But a point turner is just your best friend when it comes to this. You wanna make sure you get your batting laid down flat in there too, because it should take up that whole corner. And then what we're gonna be doing is starting from the middle here, pulling this just kind of back to us and laying that over. Now you can either use a straight pen or you can use the little clips, whatever, but we're gonna just lay that down. And because it's already pressed, you can see how easy this is to turn. And like I said, I always start in the middle of a side and then work to the left or to the right. And another thing, if you're working with those little pens that don't have any heads on them, it's time you get some good quilting pens that have the, the nice head on them. I call those other pens, it's funny because I call those other pens rummage sale pens because I can remember my mom pricing things for rummage sale using those pens. And um, they're, they're real small and they're hard to get in your hands and these just make it so much easier. And you can see that this is pretty much ready for stitching. So I've got half of it here. I'm just gonna go ahead and do just that half so that we can see what we're going to be doing. So I'm gonna use, and I'm just gonna tell you, this is what I use on almost everything. I'm gonna use a narrow zigzag. You could use a straight stitch, you can use a decorative stitch, you can use whatever. Now, the reason I like to use a zigzag is because if I use a straight stitch, you see how my fabric just kind of comes there and it's kind of bundled up there, it's just a little extra. A zigzag just kind of evens that all out. So that's why I like to use a zigzag on this. So I'm gonna set the zigzag but I'm going to adjust it because I don't want it like three millimeters wide. I only want it about two, and then I'm gonna adjust the length. Now, we're gonna test this on a piece of our scrap to see if it's what we want. And once you get this, write it down so that you can use it again next time and you won't have to do that setting. So I'm gonna show you that there is pretty close, except I'm gonna distance this out because it doesn't need to be that close together in the stitching. Now I'm sewing on a Janome M7 today. And what I have it set at is a width of 2.0 and a length of 1.8. So let me show you what that looks like. And I can guarantee you, even though it's supposed to be accurate, across the board, you probably won't be able to depend on those numbers. You're probably just going to have to test it yourself. So now when I go in here to do that stitching, I'm just gonna put it so that it is just a little bit left of center. So if you have a guide foot, you can use that. I'm gonna just use my regular foot here so that you can see it. And it's just, a, like I said, a little left of center. Now I don't wanna sew over those pens and I usually use my um, point turner somewhat as a guide like this. So it just kind of lays down there and guides that fabric right in. When you get to the corner, the easiest way is to leave your needle down in the fabric in the left side. Raise your foot and turn it. 
and then reposition. I'm going to take this pin out and we're just going to come down this other side. But you can see how my point turner just kind of holds that. You could probably use a stylist or your purple thing or anything just in front here to hold that in place. So we're just going to finish that part up. We'll do one more corner so you can see that again. Now remember, if this was a thread that matched like I would normally do, it's just going to kind of fade in to the stitching or to the fabric. Now I'm too far this way in talking. I let that go too far and that might happen to you too. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch either my needle up or my hand wheel. If you do your hand wheel, always turn it towards you. And I'm just going to scoot this back to where I want it, put my needle back in and continue on. Your corner is going to be fine. There's not going to be a problem there, but you can see how that just puts that right around that edge. Now I've got several projects I'm going to show you in a, just a few minutes that you're not going to see this because it matches and it will make a whole lot more sense why I would like it. Now that's not offensive. That's the color of this right here. So, you know, you could use that that way. It wouldn't be my favorite, but it would work. But notice these nice mitered corners and it was easy as pie to do. And this is gonna look a whole lot better once it's pressed. So hang on a second. While you're doing that, Donna, we've got some great questions coming in. Uh, Kathy Duane is wanting to know, can you make the binding not as wide? Yes, and that's what I wanna, I wanna show you some of those options. So this right now is three quarters of an inch. And I'm going to show you some other options. Are there any other questions, Mike? Yeah, there sure is. And actually, Dale and Kathy was wanting to know the same thing. So it looks like she's also saying great demo and tips. Um, and it says, uh, can this border binding be made narrower or wider, which we're going to address. Will the same technique work? Um, and then Carolyn is wondering, is the corner seam, uh, is the corner seam pressed to a side? No. She's probably talking about this. We do not do any pressing of that. It will lay just perfect when you go in here. You can see this, it's laying perfectly flat. And you don't wanna do any pressing of this until you're finished with this stitching. Don't put your pins in and then press. That will create problems. I learned that early on. You can probably tell my background is in home economics. I was a teacher for seven years before I opened my store. And I learned early on that when you put a hem in, you don't do any pressing to that until the hem is finished. And it does make a lot of difference. And the same thing with this. Don't do any pressing until you're actually finished. But you can see how nice and flat that miter lays front and back. Boy, it, right. really, it really does look great. Yeah, and easy to do because you can imagine being able to do those 12 placemats in a short amount of time. So let's go big first. OK, so let's say that you were doing this is a polar fleece fabric right here. And this is a flannel and you were making a blanket and you wanted to have a nice flannel backing on your polar fleece. Now, this can apply to many different things. But rather than just having that little tiny binding, the little one turning around, this one is four inches. So how did I do that? Okay. It's not doubled four inches. That would be expensive to constantly be doubling all this. This has a half inch turned first and then the four inches. So if I had this, so this wasn't finished here and this was laying out, this is four and a half inches out this way. So let's just use this mat here 
and put this on the edge like so. And so you can see this from here to there is four and a half inches. So I would have cut that all the way around four and a half inches. And then I would have gone back and pressed in a half inch. And honestly, you guys, sometimes I go around first and just sew it at a half inch. The stitching will be right on this edge, but it will not only stabilize that edge, it will make it so you know exactly where to press it under. And so you would do all of that. And when you are doing this technique, you're gonna do it the same way. So you would have put this on when it's, you know, got the border laying out here, four and a half and four and a half. You would have put this on and drawn the same way. And remember the little hash mark goes in where this intersects with your fold. And so in that case, you would have drawn this and either got another ruler or pushed this out and made the line longer and pushed this down and made the line longer. And that's the way that you're going to be able to know where to turn this and make that little fold just like you did before and turn this into the inside. And now you haven't wasted a ton of fabric because you only turned under a half inch and then this is four inches and you've still got that nice mitered corner. So you can do that in a lot of different sizes. I do it quite often on placemats. So here's a placemat. And all I did was the same concept. I wanted a finished edge of two and a quarter inches. So I cut this two and three fourths. Okay, so there would be two, that's a half. So there's my two and three fourths. I would have folded it in a half inch, done that same idea, and then I've got my miter turned around. Now, interestingly enough on this, this centerpiece laid down here, there's nothing done to it. It's not quilted, it's not anything. This wouldn't even really have to be clear out to the edge. You could just have that laid on top of this one happens to be a fusible fleece because I wanted it to have a little bit of a body to it. And so the fusible side is to the back, okay? The fusible side is to the back. And I just cut this, I believe it's 13 by 18 because that's what I always do. Yes, it is. And so I just cut that fusible fleece 13 by 18 and laid it down and allowed that two and a half inches so I'm just going to, or two and three fourths, so I'm just going to say five and a half inches bigger at least. And then I did that cutting, just like I said, it shows you in um, the instructions. Because once you understand how to do the original one, just like the one that we did here, then you'll understand how you can work with this. Now, one more thing I want to show you before I show you um, some other samples. This is the one that I happen to have a flying goose. So the flying goose from here to here is a quarter of an inch. And if I just cut my batting and my backing off here and turned it in, that's what my flying goose is going to look like. So if I decide that I want this to be the three force turned, I need to add on a half inch. So in other words, my quilt top, my placemat, my whatever is going to lay there and I'm going to measure out three fourths or excuse me, a half inch from that so that I've got a quarter inch here, a half inch here. Because no one knows when I turn this up like that, that there's not fabric underneath there and why does there need to be fabric there's batting that's perfectly fine so from there i measured out my inch and a half folded it in like i suggested and then when this comes into here it makes a perfect point on that flying goose you don't have any problems with it it's not getting the point cut off and it just makes it super super easy to be able to use that now because someone asked, and I, this is why this is like this, I'm gonna show you 
if I take this off and I only want this to be, let's say a total of a half inch. In this case, I've got a quarter here and a quarter here. And so I'm going to then just be doing this like this. I wouldn't have that much fabric because I would have only allowed a half inch. And you can see now that I only have that narrow half inch binding. So you've got, the, there's several ways that you can do this. If this was one where this didn't have it, so let's just go to the other side so you can kind of figure it out, forget about these corners. We could bring this right up to the corner here. We would leave our um, fabric only, only a half inch. So let's just say this is all cut off to a half inch. And then when you turn that in and press it and turn it in like this, you're only going to see, excuse me, that first one was an inch, not a half inch. Now you're only gonna see a half inch right there. So yes, you can do it narrower. Now I've had some people say, and I know this is a ton of information in a short amount of time, but I've had some people say they want it to look like an add-on binding. So to make this heavier, they've done just what I did here. They would have cut this to two inches and folded it in. Now it's only an inch and they fold it in again to make it a half inch and they fold this in. So now this is heavier, a little bit thicker. You can still do all of the techniques. You would need to do your pressing, of course, but it's a little bit heavier. So that's another option. So many different things that you can do. And when you're, I shouldn't even have pinned that in front of you like that. Whenever you're pinning something to stitch, you wanna pin it perpendicular to the direction that you're gonna stitch. So you would wanna turn that this way so the pen is holding that without being moved as you sew. Any questions after that, Mike? You bet, yeah, we got a couple of them here. Uh, Dale and Kathy, we're wanting to know, for the larger border, are you still stitching the three quarters inch top to batting, then the four and a half inch for your binding? No, you're measuring out the four and a half and I'm turning in a half. There's no three fourths in that. So you would have measured out four and a half, turned in a half and pressed it and then turned in the whole four inch. I wish I could open that up so you could see it, but the only thing I can show you is right down here on the end. You can see that right here's my edge and if I could open this completely up from there to there is four and a half inches, okay? And then I pressed under a half inch and then turned this whole thing in after I did my mitered corner. Perfect. And then and this is just stitched on the edge right here. Perfect. But I tell you, your samples are just outstanding. And one thing I do wanna mention, um, you're right. There is a ton of information that you're sharing and it's, it's all amazing. But the cool thing is that they'll be able to go back and rewatch this. So guys, exactly. this, is, this is not a time limited deal. We're going to have this available for you guys. Um, especially if you've not done this before, this is going to be an invaluable tool that you guys can refer back to. Um, we did have one other question here. Cindy was wanting it to see the, so can you please show us what the back looks like. And I believe you were working with your first sample at that moment. Okay. I can if I can find it. <laughs> there it is. So this is what the back looks like. It's just the little zigzag. You can see that this is where I stopped with my quilting. 
And that's the thing you have to remember is if you're going to be turning it, you can't stitch right out to the edge because you don't want that out in there. So you just have to remember to, you know, stop at that. Here's one that I'll show you. This is one of my samples. So like or when I when I teach this, because I, I call this my two minute demo. So when we would have shop hops, I could sit on a stool and demo this day in and day out just because of it's a simple sample. So this is what we did first. We measured out three quarters of an inch, did our markings, turned it. This is what it looked like right here when we stitched it. This is what it looked like before and then when we turn it. And this is what it looks like when you're stitching. But think about this. This was actually a quilt that I cut up. Okay, so that's my quilting that I did before I turned those um, edges. So this was like an 18 inch quilt. You can see this right here so that I just cut it up into four pieces so I could show you the sample of what it was, how it works. So you can see on the back of the one that's stitched here how we look. And of course, again, when it's the matching thread, it just pretty much hides itself altogether. I've got samples here I'm going to show you at the end of all of these that are actual projects that are finished, but not with red thread. So hold on and we'll show you that. Now the next thing, what happened is I had this tool and everybody, this the quick easy miter binding tool. Remember, it's a binding tool. And everybody was like right back at that time starting to do the hexagons and the octagons. And they wanted to still be able to do this type of thing on their projects. So I came out with what was called the dual angle quick easy miter binding tool. So the dual angle, the whole idea of that was that we would have two on the same template. So most of us don't know the angles, 120 degrees and 135 degrees. Those are hexagon and 135 is octagon, okay? So this is what that tool looks like. The hexagon is down here with the 120, the 135 is the octagon. And you're looking at that going, well, how in the world, Donnell, would I know what I'm supposed to do with it? Well, it's very simple, okay? So this is my project right here, all right? So it comes to the point down here at the point. This is a right angle. So with that one, you're going to be using the original tool that I just showed you. Okay, that's going to work perfect. What you go by are these lines right here that fits. Now, if I come down to this corner here, that doesn't fit. It's these two lines that doesn't fit there. So I don't care whether it's a hexagon or an octagon. I'm going to test these. Oh, looky there, I got it the first time. That line and that line line up. So just by chance, if I turned it around, you can see here's the line, but then it goes up this direction. So you don't have to know what the angle is. You don't have to know what the angle is called. You just take your tool and figure it out. And we do the very same thing. We cut up next to our edge, or if you want to add on, you're going to add on your batting. This is an inch and three-fourths. We pressed it all in, just like we did before, on all of the sides. And then we came back, and in this case, we pull this down right like this. Draw that little shape. I think you can see it. Put the little lines right here and we're gonna turn it and do the same thing. And after we've done that, we're gonna do these four that way. So let's just take this one, it's not finished. So let's just take this, lay that right on there, get our marker, mark it, 
Only go one direction. You see what happens when you go both directions? It doesn't work. And then mark across here. And that's going to be the way we mark all of those four. These on the end, as I said, are a right angle. So I'm going to take this one, lay it like this. And for some reason, you guys, it just looks totally different than if it was on a four-sided shape. But it's the same one, trust me. And now I'm going to mark this and this, and we'll fold it up just the same way as we did and stitch it. And it's going to look like this. Pretty much looks the same, except it's for an octagon. Push that back in. And we're just putting that right around there. So it's done the same way. It's the two angles that are created when you're making different shapes, such as the hexagon and the octagon. And the funny thing is, is I've had people tell me that they don't even take their project. They just use what's on the front of the envelope as a picture and they know there how they're going to do it. Because if your pattern has been printed on the uh, cover in actuality, in other words, they've taken a straight on shot, you're going to be able to do this same thing. So that's the 135 there. And if I turn this one around, this is the 120. And you can see it fits right on my picture so that I know, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And so rather than making these, I mean, I had no idea. This was a one hit wonder. Crazy, crazy, crazy wonder. And I had no idea they'd come back and want it for this. So I said, well, you know what? We're going to use the same tool and we're going to make both ends on it to obviously save money. And the thing that you need to remember on this is this inside piece is the bulk of your project. This goes to the outer edge. So when I'm doing this, this corner, well, that's not the right corner. Let's come over here. This corner right here, it's not the right one. Let's go this way. This comes out. So this is in the bulk of my project. And always think of it that way. So that's how we do those two angles. And again, I have several projects I'm going to show you at the end that are all finished that way. So that's done pretty much the same way with just a little bit different angle. So those are the binding tools. So I'm now going to show you the border tool. And these were all driven by the fact that it's not easy to create a perfect miter. And so once you get started on it, it's like, OK, we got to figure this out. So let's make a tool for it. So next, it's the quick, easy border mitering tool. And that quick, easy border mitering tool has a little bit more instruction in it because if you're doing borders, you have to allow extra fabric to be able to miter those borders. So that information is listed right here. It's a chart that's in the beginning of the instructions and again you can see they're all nice and pictured the only thing i apologize for is the pictures are getting kind of you know the fabrics are not exactly what we would pick today but hey that's not a problem to me it's the instructions that you're going for so let's get down here and get a project oh i got them right here and so this happens to be the one that's on the front of the pattern. So I had a 12 inch square. It's actually a nine patch. You can see I've got half square, what do you call it? Quarter square triangle up here on the end. And so, you know, it makes it so that down here, we've got that point. We don't want to lose that point. And so we're going to be cons uh, considerate of that. So what we do on this particular one is we are going to stitch the border. You can see 
It's quite a bit bigger. This one's out here. We stitched the border on. Now you would have the whole thing. I don't have it on here for the demo, but you would have the whole thing. But you stitch the border on and you stop a quarter of an inch from the corner. So you can see right there, I've stitched it right up to that diagonal stitching because that should be the quarter. And then I back stitched. And I always like to pin my borders on from the center out. And so in this case, I've stitched them from the center out and the center out. It doesn't matter. You can go the whole distance. But this one has also been stitched right up to that quarter of an inch. So right in there, you can see there's not any stitching. There's actually a stitch that's pulled out. They're supposed to be side by side, but there's not any stitching going this way or that way. And then it's time, you do that all the way around. And then we're going to use the tool to mark with. Now the tool, everybody calls it the boot because this is what it looks like. Now, when I flip this around, I can use it this way or I can use it this way. I can see through it, but I have put a lot of markings in this and the people who cut these for me have given me a scant quarter of an inch here. And I will tell you that on when you're marking this, mark this with a fine line marker like a Frixon fine line pen or a, a lead pencil that's very sharp because you wanna get an exact line on there. These lines don't mean much of anything. They are on there so that you will know when you have your border parallel to one of these lines. So your border might stop in the middle, it might stop almost to the edge here, but you're only looking for that to be parallel and laying straight. And then you can see on here, I've got your seam line from your quilt and the outside edge is the raw edge. The seam line for the quilt and the outside is the raw edge. So how do we use this funny contraption? Well, let's get back to those points. This is the corner that we're working on, okay? And whenever you're working with this, I should have probably even written it on here. This pointed edge goes out away from center. So when I'm using it on this one down here at the bottom, I'm going to turn it this way. That means this is closest to center and this is away from center. So I'm just going to flip that one up. We're not working with it right now. And I'm going to lay this one right here nice and flat. You can see I've already demoed with it. But I need to be able to see under here. So I'm just going to peel this back a bit. And I'm going to lay this down right on top so that that stitch line or seam line is right on top of my stitching. My raw edge is lined up and the same thing down here. And it's kind of nice because we've got this right through there. So that quarter square triangle here goes this way. So it's right on top of that. Now you can probably see, I'll move it up a little bit here, that right down here in this case, this one lays right on that line. That's only by chance, you guys. You can see that if it was like this, I could tell it's not straight. That's the only reason for those extra lines. So now that I've got this lined up here, I'm coming out, looking to see that this is still lined up. And this is where I would draw that line. Okay. Now I suggest when you do that, that you also take and just put an X here because this is what's going to get cut off. Not that you could cut it off any other way, but it just makes it easier for your understanding. Because now what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip back just this little bit and I need to draw the rest of it. Because when I drew that, I stopped about right there 
And I'm just going to use this edge because all I need is a straight edge. And I'm going to line it up with what I've already drawn. And I'm going to draw it right up to the edge there. That side is finished. So now I need to do this side. So I'm going to lay this out this way. I can leave that underneath there. I can flip it back out of my way, do whatever I want. But remember, the long straight side goes to the center and this side goes out towards the end. I come down here and I line this up and then I draw this line. I flip this back. Use whatever straight to your advantage and draw the rest of that. And then carefully, you are going to take, and I hate to say it like this, I always say good scissors because I know what people have, either your nice sharp ginger scissors or a pair of serrated which has little teeth and you're gonna cut right on that line. Clear through, that's why I've got my finger in here, clear through to that edge. And what is left is a perfect quarter of an inch. So I've already done that over on this side. So you can see I've got my edge cut or my, yes, my edge cut clear up to there. And I recommend that you not cut this until you're ready to stitch it because this is the true bias. And so now what we're gonna do is take those two edges. I like to go ahead and stitch from the outside into the inside and you'll see why here in just a second. So I'm gonna put that pin in. I'm gonna carefully make sure my edges are even and put that one in and I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna make sure those are even and right across where that pen is placed, that's my stopping point. That's my stopping point. So I would start out here, I would sew my quarter of an inch in and stop right at that point. And when you're finished with that, you're gonna be able to just simply press that super, super flat and it lays like this. I mean, it'll just lay like this on the ironing board because of the way it's put together. There's no clipping or trimming or anything in here. It'll lay perfect like that. Now, any of you that have done miters like this, because I have a quilt here on the wall that I wish I could show you, but um, it's kind of impossible with the way my camera's set up, but uh, it cups in because I didn't know how to do this. And it's just like a little cup in here and this kind of cups out, but you can see how nice and flat this lays. I, if I get it back there, how perfectly flat that lays and there's no little cupping or anything like that. So that's how you would do the perfect miter on a border. Now, the next step, let me see, Mike, are there any questions? You know, I got to be honest with you. I think that you're doing such a great job uh, with all of your uh, examples that you have. We we don't have any questions. Joe, am I missing any? No, no. no I, actually, there was one, but I was able to do that one by myself. Um, they were asking about instructions with the tool, and I just let them know, um, yes, you definitely get the instructions and the full color pictures. So Yeah, you're going to have all of those things I was telling you. You can see right there is the pinning steps that I just did. And like I said, I was actually using the sample from this and it's so easy to stitch that perfect quarter of an inch. Now that's where I would definitely use my quarter of an inch foot. You wanna make sure you're using a quarter of an inch foot. Now the next question comes usually is, well, what if I have one like this and I've got two borders? Do I do all of that whole process twice? No, I only do it once. I sewed my narrow border because this is the same one right here. I stitched my narrow border on, I pressed it, and then I do all of that process. Now I wanted to show you, I guess I don't even have it here, but when you're doing a wide border like this, 
you really don't even have, this is not the same fabric. That's my, actually my selvage, but you don't have to take this piece clear out to the edge because you really only need it to stop about right there because your miter is going to be this way. So that's an option. I think it's on one of my other samples coming up here, but you can go ahead and put your borders all together and then do that mitering once and you're going to have a perfect miter throughout the whole thing because of the way that tool is designed to line all of that up all in one fell swoop. So that makes it super easy on that. Now, interestingly enough, um, I think if you've been quilting for a while, you know that back in about 2011, 2012, so many people were doing attic window. And so they were using smaller things. And so I had some people come to me and say, hey, can you make this template smaller? Can I make this template smaller? This is a little wieldy. And I'm like, well, yeah, I suppose I can. And basically, I'm trying to think where my instructions went because they have the same instructions only in a smaller package. But it looks like I have dropped them somewhere. So anyway, no, here they are. Anyway, this is called the mini quick easy border mitering tool. So you can see when you do the attic window, you're going to be doing that same mitering and you can use the mini tool real easily to do that. The other thing is when you're not using a great big project, you're doing something small like this and putting a border on this big tool is kind of clumsy. So it's all in what you want to do. You know, this will work the same way because guess what, you guys? It's the same thing. It's just this part of it. All right. It's the same tool cut down. It's just that it's smaller. So it's totally up to you. You can do this on these big ones. But if you're doing a lot of them, you might want the mini. Because like I said, on this, this is the same concept. You can see that perfect miter right there. But this is only an inch and a half wide border. So it's a whole lot easier to do it with the smaller one. So I would suggest when you're getting this, just decide what's going to be your first project and see how you can do it. Because guess what? If you had the little one and you needed the longer lines, again, all you got to do is get your line started and then use some sort of an extension ruler, but make sure you get it perfectly straight to draw that line. So the mini is just simply what it says. It's the little sibling to this one right here. So they're the same. The instructions are pretty much the same. Just one size may not fit all there. So that's why we have those two. You know, I got to tell you, I just got to chime in here uh, because I've thought this so many times throughout your demonstration today. There's just so many little aha moments when I'm looking at all how thoughtfully designed your tools are. Now, obviously, it's my job to sell and I know and you do such a great job of it. But I mean, just watching you use the tools, how all the different lines are set up, everything just comes together. I mean, so many times I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, that just makes so much sense. And I know I'm speaking for everybody else when I say that. But just so many aha moments. It's just incredible. I mean, really thoughtfully designed. Well, you know, the thing that's funny about it, when I designed my very first tool, I was still teaching eighth grade, seventh and eighth grade, and I tested it with them. I took my advanced class of sewing and I tested it with them. And I thought, well, if they can do it, anybody can do it. So I'll try my regular students and anybody can do it. They can do it. And I realized because I'm a picture person, anytime you add a lot of pictures to your instructions, you make it a whole lot easier for everybody to do. So that's why I've done that. I've, I appreciate the opportunity to show these today because I know people need them, but they may not realize what they're going to do for them. So that's the great part of this uh, demo today. So the next thing, I certainly did not know we would get to this, and that is people wanted to be able to do their borders 
on their octagons and their hexagons. Now this pa this um, tool here, I don't have it in here. Well, yes, I do. It comes with two free patterns and I have obviously all the pictures, everything's lined out here. It's just now we're gonna be doing borders on an octagon or a hexagon. So if I was doing the borders on this project, and you can see this is again, the sample from the front, it's the same type of thing. I want to be able to have that nice mitered border here where it lays flat. And so we don't have to come down here and just hack it off and then put something else on and try and make it work. So this is what this looks like before it has anything on it, okay? So basically you've got three squares and you got four triangles put together and you can tell here that we have a quarter of an inch. So we want that border to finish right there. Same thing down here. I want this to come in a quarter of an inch and this so that I end up with a nice point right there. So that's the way we would start. That's our piece that's gonna get us going. And then this is the one that I just showed you, okay? So in this case, we are going to stitch a quarter of an inch and stop. So if I put this right here on my ruler, you can see that this from there to there is that quarter of an inch. So that border was stitched on there and then pressed and we stopped obviously at that quarter of an inch. And then what we're gonna be doing is doing that the tw twice, okay, from each one. And then we're gonna use the angle here that lines up to be able to do the miter. So this particular tool comes with two pieces. And those two pieces are a little bit bigger because they have to be. So this one is the octagon and this one is the hexagon. They look somewhat similar, but you can see down here, they're different angles. So the same thing works. The lines across here are for parallelism. And by then I got to the point where I realized having a nice little hole here worked great because when we're doing this, let me flip it over, we can then kind of put a straight pin right there to hold things in place. Now, when I look at this, I'm like, mm, which one is that? I don't know. Remember, this is our quilt. The one with the hole in it is our quilt. And so I'm gonna lay this down here. I don't believe that looks correct, okay? So I'm gonna take the other one and lay it down here. This is our quilt and look there. My seam line lines up, my raw edge lines up, my seam lines lined up here, my raw edge is lined up, so this is the one I'm gonna use. Again, this goes to the outside, so I'm gonna flip this out of my way and lay this one down. Come back in here and line it up. And like I said, if you want to, you can get that right in there and you could put a straight pin right there to hold it in place. I wanna get it straight. And then this is where we would draw. Draw right down through here and see down here, nothing lines up, nothing down here lines up, but we can tell it's parallel. So we know that it is correct. So I'm gonna draw that flip this back, draw the rest of that one. And then I'm gonna change my direction and come over here, get this out of the way. Flip it over, this goes to the outside. Did I flip it? Oh yeah, I was going for that seam. Here we go. Right there's where we want this. And now we look down here to see that it's parallel. We would draw here, flip this back, and then just move up and or draw up to there. And then those are gonna get cut off. 
they're going to get stitched together. And then when it's finished, obviously, they're going to make that miter that continues this right on out to the edge. So it's going to come right off of here and continue on out. So that's what we're doing here today, huh? This one is a small octagon. Okay, this is one of your patterns that's in there. And this is done the very same way, except we're gonna use the other one of these because as you can see, let's pull this back up. As you can see, this is how it matches up right along there. So I've stitched these two seams on, stopping a quarter of an inch from the edge. I came over here, well, that one's completely finished. So I did my marking and then I stitched it. And on this, because of the way this is done, this is not gonna be mitered off of there because that wouldn't make any sense. It's coming straight out of this corner here. So this is an octagon quilt that is done with the miter. Now, that's all of the tools that way. They all have their purpose. You can't do a octagon with a mitering tool that is supposed to be for a hexagon. I mean, I've had people say, well, I can only afford one. And I just, I, I just, you know, I gotta, I just want one. Which one do I get? Well, what's your project? You know, that's just the way it is because of the complexity of way, the way the tools are designed. You can't just use um, interchangeably, I guess is the best way to say it. Now, I wanted to show you this, and then I'm going to show you some samples. On this one, I use the mitered border. I use the one that was for the 90 degrees and then I use the one that was the dual angle to put those borders on. But then this is my back brought to the front using my binding tool. So that although this is way wider because it's two and a half, yeah, it's way wider than that. I use my back to the front to make it so it was like a binding. So you can see down here, I laid this on here. I determined what distance I needed here. And this is going to come and wrap around and take up a quarter of an inch of that space. So this side is only sewn so far so that you can see that. And so we would then be using the tools to turn this. Obviously, it's too far gone that I can't put the tool up in there but this would be turned down that half inch and then come up into here. That's probably why I stopped is because I got too far into it. But anyway, this comes up and around so that it makes that binding that way. So I've actually used the binding tool to create this outer border to bring that around. Now you, you gotta remember, you can't just jump in and do all of this at once. You kind of have to get the hang of it. And then you'll have all of those what if moments. Okay, it seems like if I do this, then I could do that. And that will be factual for you. So let's see some of these samples now, because that's what's going to make it so that you understand why I love this. And you might have seen some of these because these are samples I have done on some of the events. So this was one that I did last year at the 4th of July. And you can see here, this is my backing that I brought to the front. And this is a hexagon. So my little corner or my little points right here are mitered right off of that hexagon. So this is the, this is the front and I've brought that binding around. And so that's just makes it so it's just, you know, easy enough to do. I didn't have to worry about trying to miter this angle when I was doing my binding by doing an add-on binding. The next one is simply a rectangle. 
And you can see that again, I have used, uh, in this case, I used uh, charm squares and put my project together, done my quilting, and then I brought the back to the front. So you can see those of you that were asking what it looks like on the back, you can see my quilting. And then you can also see that little narrow zigzag that finished that front. There's the miter. The next one has borders and binding. So I did my quilting. Well, I've put it together and then this is what the quilting looks like from the back. But when you have something that you know you're going to be having a design that miters like this, it's nice to have your border mitered. So my border is mitered right here. And this is just the stitching in the ditch to do my design. Now in this particular one, this can't be mitered coming both ways. So you can see my design comes down here and then I have a little quilt design in the corner, but I still have the miter right through there. And then I mitered my binding onto that. Let's come back here to see, yeah, this is the opposite corner. You can see it real good on this because of the fact that that's a lighter color there. And you can see how this miters and how that's mitered in there. I think some, some borders look better with cornerstones or they look better butted up like that. But there are many quilts that they are very enhanced by the fact that this is a mitered edge there. This is one of the ones that has the points here and here. And on this particular one, because of the design that I was doing, I didn't want this border mitered. So I had it blunt here, but my binding is mitered. So it just depends on what you're doing with your designing from what I knew I was gonna do down here with this kind of a sun ray type thing, it was not gonna look right with the miter that way. So that's why I did it. And you can see the backside here. This is another one. Of course, these are all template quilted. And this is similar to that other one. I've, I've left this so that it comes across this way. My corners are mitered, but my border is not mitered. And you can see this down here. It's kind of funny when we're all looking at the corners of a quilt. A little bit of a hint that I will tell you is when you're using a thread, if you're trying to match it exactly, you're going to end up lighter than this. Not that there's a problem with that, but when you're matching it up, when it's on the spool, it is going to be lighter when you pull it off. So you can go a shade darker and then it will match better. So what they say is thread sews in lighter than it really is. Okay. Thread sews in lighter than what it really is. I'd just like to echo what Kathy was just saying that, boy, Donnell, I mean, you really do some amazing work. And I know everybody just really appreciates seeing all of these examples from your uh, trunk show, if you will. Uh, but I did. I, I just wanted to, to verbally uh, reiterate what Kathy said, that just great work. So beautiful. I mean, thank it's, you. It's amazing how exact and precise you can get using these tools. And that's the main reason that I absolutely love them. I mean, it's just every single time it's, it's quick and easy. I don't have to think, you know, now what do I do here? You might be looking at your directions, but it's not going to be something that's going to be difficult for you. So this is another little trick because I said I would show you how you can add things in. This happens to be a hexagon. 
So I mitered my border, obviously here. My design works around that miter. Believe it or not, this is a heart template from our template quilting or template quilting. This is a heart and I only stopped at the top and then flipped it around to join these. And this is part of what we call template quilting because that little frosted fabric is actually underneath and cut out. I don't know how much that shows up there. But this is what's fun about this. I had this whole thing ready to turn. The corners were here and I was ready to turn it. And I was like, man, I wanna put a little lighter fabric right in there. So I just took some two and a half inch strips of fabric, pressed them in half and stuck them down in there before I stitched it. I just have them underneath here. They're not connected in any way. This one's not connected to this. They just lay right down in underneath there. And then when I stitch that down, of course, then we get this little extra. And you can do the same thing with like rickrack. And I can't even believe I'm saying that because I thought rickrack ended when my grandma passed away, um, which was quite a while ago. But no, it's big. It's still big. You can use all different widths of it. That could just lay right down in there also. And so you can embellish real easily by putting some sort of trim in there. And some of the trims that you might have just a scrap of or whatever you can use on your smaller projects. You don't have to put them on all sides. You could just put it on one or two sides or whatever. And you know, it's just really a lot of fun to see what we can do with our different um, uh, extra embellishment type things that we have. Now I'm gonna step away from the mic for just a second to get a few more examples over here that kind of got out of my way. So I'll be right back. Well, I gotta, I'll just jump right in here. Uh, I'm gonna repeat what we were kind of talking at the beginning here. Guys, all of these tools that Donnell is showing, we do have free shipping right now on the website. That is for all of the items that Donnell is showing you guys today. They all have free shipping. Joe, if you don't mind, can you go ahead? Just We're going to go ahead and put that link in the comments one more time because I do know that we've got um, about a third of you guys watching on Facebook, and this way you guys will also have access to the link. But again, all of the items that Donnell is showing today do have free shipping right now on the soforless.com website. Um, I'm not sure if that link is going to work. We may have to put the HTTPS colon. I'll take care of that in just a second here. Um, but, but really just uh, an outstanding amount of information. Uh, and that's one of the things that's really kind of cool about these live events. Um, you guys can rewatch it. I did see that some of you kind of joined us in the middle here. And you will have the opportunity to rewatch it in its entirety. We will have this. We will keep this on the soforless.com website so that you guys can rewatch it at your leisure. Yeah, seeing some of these comments coming in. Um, is the free shipping to Canada as well? It is not. Uh, and right now, uh, I'll have to double check. I'm not sure if we are shipping to Canada right now. We may have to make an exception for this show. Um, so I'll do that here in just a second as Donnell is grabbing some more examples. But I am kind of curious, guys. Uh, have you guys used anything like this before or have you um, tamed corners before using um, just the, I guess, standard method of uh, pressing and kind of trying to line everything up without any tools? Because um, it just seems like everything that she's created is just um i don't know very well laid out all of the uh the lines everything as i mentioned before just so many aha moments as i sit here and i watch her uh create it's like man that just it it just makes it so well like you said quick and easy yep and this is one that was, um a placemat set that i was making and you can see it's easily you could channel quilt this I think these kind of projects are what are fun. You can experiment on your machine. Maybe you want to uh, do some twin needle. You've never done some twin needle quilting. You could do some twin needle quilting. This was done with uh, templates um, from Westerly. These are the background fills, and these are a fun set to use. But you can see how fast that is. 
to be able to just turn that back around to the front. And then what I did is I used my uh, cutter and I cut out some leaves and had some fusible on the back. So I just fused those in place there. And this is an another one of them. None of them are the same. I have a whole set of six and they're all different. And then this is another one that I was playing with. And this is one that does not have the, the miters or the borders or anything like that. But I would the reason I'm showing this to you is because although I really like this, I think the crispness of having this nice border turned around makes it, you know, just a little bit nicer. It's kind of a bad thing to, you know, show one that you're not really liking, but I think it just shows the fact that it is nice to have that border on there so that it gives it that nice stability. So um, that's pretty much all I have to show you today. There, I know there was a lot in that, you know, short amount of time, but it's great that you can come back and watch it again. And once you get going with these, I think you're going to find that you're going to tackle a project that you may not have tackled just because you know it's going to be doable. And Mike mentioned it at the very beginning that you might get some projects out that you haven't done. And I had a lady write this to me. She said, I've always loved putting together the colors and shapes of a quilt, but too often finishing it has made me fold it up and put it on a shelf. Your new quick, easy miter binding tool, new back in 2005, has been amazing. I finished three shelved quilts and I'm now working on a fourth. My mitered corners look professional. And this was from a lady in Muncie, Indiana. And I, the next printing of this, I said, I got to put that on there because that's exactly why I created the tool is because I would do the same thing. I'd get everything together and then I was like, yeah, I'll put that binding on sometime. Now I'm going to be the first one to tell you if I'm making um, what I'm going to call an heirloom quilt, one that I'm like, you know, mm, I think that should be around a hundred years from now and everybody should be able to look at it and say, wonder who Donnell is. You know, I'm, I'm kind of joking there, but not. The add-on bindings are definitely a heavier and stronger for the long haul of a quilt. But how many of us are doing placemats and baby quilts and little wall hangings and that kind of thing that we really expect to be around in a hundred years? And so that's why this is so usable. Whenever you're making a a baby quilt or you're making um, placemats or, you know, wall hangings that are seasonal, that are only out for maybe three, you know, weeks, four weeks. It's just so much easier to put this type of a finish on them. Now that's different for the miter borders because a miter border is just something for aesthetics, what you like, what it looks like. And as I look around, I've got 12 quilts hanging here in my studio. And as I look around when I, you know, what can draw your attention to them is how they're finished. You know, did I, did I miter the corners on that one? Did I put a cornerstone in and wish I had mitered it, you know, and that kind of thing. And so going forward, take out those things that are in your uh, closet or on your shelf or whatever, and get one of the tools and finish them up. And going forward, you can always remember that this is an option if you add that extra fabric onto the backing. And you know, sometimes it definitely even saves you um, money by doing it that way. So I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned a lot. Watch it again. Don't ever hesitate to ask questions. All of the tools, as I said, come with a picture on them. And some of them even have a QR code and that QR code will link you to a demo. That lady doing the demo probably doesn't look the same as she used to, but you know what? It is what it is. So thanks, Mike, for allowing me to join you and um, sure. your people. And uh, so I, I do. Pleasure. I got a couple of things that I, I just some loose ends here, real quick. One is, um, did you want to show that that centering ruler real quick? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at it. It's right here. And I didn't even say anything about it. Thank you. Thank you. Centering ruler is probably the one that I can't even hardly keep up with right now. And the reason for that is 
I use it in a ton of different ways. First of all, it's a 12 and a half inch ruler. Starts here at the edge, goes to the other end, 12 and a half inches, bingo. No big deal. It does have the quarter of an inches here. So if I'm measuring something, it's easy enough to put those on the lines and see through my ruler. But the other side of this starts in the center and goes out to six on either end. And the whole idea of that is this makes centering my borders um, when I'm doing um, designs easy. It also allows me, I'm just going to show you this because let me take a quick guess. Okay, so this was cut nine and a half inches wide, I think. And so it's nine inches. Well, I needed to find, after it's stitched in, I needed to find the center here. So I can put my zero about where I want it. And then I look over here and on this side, I'm looking on these and I look over here. Well, lo and behold, where I thought was center, that's perfect four and a half there. But over here, it's about an eighth of an inch off. So all I need to do is split that difference just like that. And now I've got my perfect center. Something as simple as that takes the headache. I do it every, I love math and science. You can tell by the way I've designed my tools. But you know what? I want to take all of the math out of it when I'm teaching. So when I say center that, and this lady comes up and says, well, Donnell, mine's just a little bit off, yada, yada, yada. And, you know, you got the tears because I don't want to have to divide eight and seven eighths in half and figure that. Neither do I. So all I'm going to do is put where I think is about center and then look here, following the numbers down here, and I can just center that up and find it. And so that's just one of the easy ways that I can use that. Now, I'm going to show you something because this is what I was doing right before we went live today. So let me get it here. When you are cutting something out with your rotary cutter, I'm going to share a technique that I think really saves a lot of time. So I've got just a piece of fabric here. You can tell it was what I used for my backing. And I'm just going to lay this out like this. And I've got my batting. And I'm going to lay that out. And we're going to just pretend there's something on the front here. I can get down here and cut, get what I cut off. And we're just gonna say that's all covered up. And so now I want to measure out for whatever reason, well, I'm gonna say that I'm gonna measure out here. Um, three inches. This ruler, I'm gonna pull it back just a little bit. This ruler is two and a half inches wide, okay? So the easy way to do this is to take this ruler, count in two lines because that's a half inch, and then take my two and a half inch ruler and butt it up against there. Two ruler measurements are great. Whether this is using this ruler, which I do like because of the fact that with this one, I can get up to four and a half inches. But right now I put this on a half here. And with this, if I go to cut this, this is my three inches. So I now have a shorter ruler that's getting everything lined up and a longer ruler that I can just go ahead and lay there. I can even let go of that one and I can go ahead and cut this. And that's another reason I use this ruler a lot. And if you do any kind of um, 
marking um, and or quilting with this. I actually quilt along the side of this with my ruler foot and I've put stable tape on the back of this ruler. And it's a perfect tw um, two inches wide. So if you're doing something that's two inches, that's obviously gonna make it super simple to do. And of course you've got the lines on here that you can see through very easily when you're trying to line that up. I like the fact that when I'm doing this, it almost illuminates my edge here of my um, ruler because of the color that it is. And you can see through this on any color of fabric. So um, a centering ruler, I, I, I can't even begin to tell you, I've got three here right now because sometimes I want something that I can actually measure a diagonal that's longer and I'll use two of them together. If this ruler here is over at the cutting table, I'll just lay these two together and then I've got my long diagonal. So um, I can't tell you, it's kind of like if I ask you, what do you do with your microwave? Do, can you do without your microwave? And you probably say, oh no, don't take it away. And I say, what do you do with it? And you're kind of like dumbfounded. Uh, I heat up water. I, you know, whatever. It's not like you're going to run off a list of things that you can do. And that's kind of the th same thing with this centering ruler. I use it all of the time. It lays right beside my um, table, my sewing table. I've got one at the cutting table. I actually have um, multiple machines set up in here and they all have one because I use it so much. Now, if you have one of the um, Sew Steady tables, you've got a measure. I don't know if you can see it clear down here, but you've got a nice measuring piece right down here. But I can't pick that up and put it on a piece of fabric. So since I've got my nice big Sew Steady table that I'm working on, whatever I'm working on with my project, I can just pick this up and do anything that I need to with it. So um, the centering ruler, it's, it, to me, it's an obvious thing that you'd want to get just because I know that those uh, having that center at zero and then being able to measure out that way makes it so nice. I love the comment. I just see it. I use my centering ruler all the time. Um, thank you for that comment because um, when I first started with these, this was what was funny, you guys. I had one that didn't have these numbers here. I just had a clear ruler that looked like this and I had taken my Sharpie and I had done this one, two, three out each direction. And I was at a show and the guy across from me, guess what he did? He cut rulers and he looked at mine and he said, you know, if you really like that ruler like that, we can custom cut that for you. And I'm like, well, duh, why didn't I think of that? Because I mean, it just, it was just the thing to do. So, um, great idea, great thing that uh, he kind of approached me with my aha uh -huh moment where I was like, nah, I didn't even think about doing that. And here I have all of these tools. So anyway, I think you'll love it. Get yourself one. I would recommend that if you're only going to start with a couple of the tools, the one you're going to use the most is the very first one. And that's the quick, easy miter binding tool. And if you do shapes that are with the octagon hexagon, you're going to probably use the dual angle tool. And then those of you that do the miter borders, that's a no brainer. You're just going to start in with the ones that are probably the, um, the 90 degree angle and then go to the dual angle. So, um, I just so appreciate the opportunity to share these because I can tell you, you can watch and see or, you know, look at a picture or whatever, but, you know, it's just like anything else. A demo makes it sing. So you really know whether you want to get uh, that tool or not. Well, I can tell you, uh, just echoing the sentiment in the comments, I think everybody has just thoroughly enjoyed this. We do have a couple of extra uh, questions, uh, if we could just address them real quick. Sure. Dory was asking, can this be hand stitched or does the stitching need to go through to the other side? It can that's be hand stitched. That's a great question, Dory. Yes, it can be hand stitched. 
Yes, definitely. I mean, it's so funny because to me, hand is a is a is a four letter word when it comes to sewing. So I was kind of thinking, what does she mean, hand stitched? There's a pill for that. No, <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But yes, you can definitely hand stitch it. Perfect. So Renee was asking, and I think we've kind of. I uh, handled this, but she was asking, where will this video be after today? And uh, I'm going to go ahead and post that in the comments uh, one more time. We've got a, a quick and easy link for you guys. We've created a shortcut link to make it a little bit easier. And I'm typing this out as I, uh, I'm i trying to. Let's see if I can do this here. And, yeah. Oh, no, that's not right. One moment. See what happens when you try to do too many things at once. So that link will not work. So one moment here, uh, we've got a special link that we created to make it a little bit easier to remember. And I keep hitting the wrong button. Nope, there it is. You know, with any live show, you might as well just figure something is going to go wrong. I guess if the worst that happens is me mistyping, that's a pretty good show. <clears throat> so let me just kind of scroll through here. A lot of comments uh, regarding the tools again um judy saying that she's been doing it by hand and this is fabulous uh silver rapture creations never seen this type of tool before these are great uh cindy i have always used the standard method she loves this so much more uh curly girl definitely a game changer i mean just the the positivity over and over and over orally law wants to know what kind of cutter are you using there it is. What cutter Mine, do you use? This happens to be, I just pulled one out, and this one happens to be by Singer. I'll be doing. Yep. It uses a standard uh, rotary cutter blade. This is the 45 millimeter. Let's see here. I was just trying to, Joe, did I miss any of these questions here? I think we might have gotten them. Oh, oh uh, someone was asking, do we need a promo code for the free shipping? Uh, you do not. Uh, I, it was asked earlier. Is it free shipping to Canada? Unfortunately, it is not. Shipping rates have just skyrocketed. I would love to be able to do it. Uh, but the thanks is just over and over, Donnell. I mean, where was that one, Joe? Here. Was the oh, what kind of? Oh, did you just cut out the leaves? Is, oh, here it is. Oh, is there a list of tools that you used in the class? Um, I think the vast majority of the tools were your own. Is that correct? Yeah, it was just my own um, other than like the cutter and the uh, uh, point turner. This is a point turner. They come in all different forms. This is one that's a bamboo point turner. So, you know, just a point turner of some kind. And you know what's interesting is, um, like I said, I have that one sample that I use when I'm doing demos at like a... Um, shop hop or something and the number of people that do not own a point turner these things are no more that you guys than maybe four or five bucks at the very most but these are just wonderful they're um the the, the home ec teacher in me is jumping out but anyway what this part right here is for is when you're sewing a shank on a button Okay, so you know how you're supposed to sew it so that the threads are long. This is for building that shank. This is a low shank, and this end down here is a high shank. And this can also be used on your sewing machine when you're machine sewing buttons, because you can put it right in there like that, put your foot down and do the zigzag, and it will create that shank. And so the same thing with this, it would be that way. But um, just a little bit of information there. It is a ruler. You can't hardly see the numbers. I'm not sure why they do it other than the fact that that's imprinted on the plastic. But obviously, I just mainly use it for that point turner. So um, that's really the only other things other than I've used a couple of markers and, uh, you know, scissors. And I will tell you, if you have not invested in a good pair of scissors, I know Mike has scissors there and I'm not sure what brand, but get yourself a good pair of scissors that you put under lock and key. Um, I've literally seen people who have put an actual lock on their scissors so nobody uses them, but it makes all the difference um, when you go to do your cutting and uh, any type of creations that you're working on. I was just highlighting some of the comments there. 
Uh, it's pretty funny. A lot of people have said that they've had that tool for years, didn't even know about <laughs> the, the helper the little, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I I do want to mention. Excuse me. Uh, R and K makes a, an exceptional point turner. I know it's it's a little bit more expensive than what you were just referring to, but uh, we we sell quite a few of those. That's the it's a weighted version. I'll put that in the uh, the show. That would yeah. and that would be great. I've seen that. It is a great one. And I will tell you another thing that they have that's a great product that you may carry. And or um, I'm not sure it's R and K. This is Femore, but that's their curved tweezers. If you have a serger or if you're doing template quilting, these are a good little item to have. And you know, I most of you probably don't know that I have um, I do have an online store, but before that, for 35 years, I had a quilt shop, and I. I'm telling you the truth. I never sold something that I didn't like. So when I would order something, I usually only ordered one because I wanted to test it out. And there were times when it's like, nope, take that. I'd tell my store manager, nope, take that off. That thing's worthless. You know, I don't want that one. I don't like that. Um, and that sounds kind of like, well, who does she think she is? Well, you know what? I want the tools to last, number one, and I want them to be worth something, number two. And if you could see right now my area, I have a magnetic bar that's about a foot long, and it is magnetized, so it fits right on the bar of my light that's above my sewing machine. And I have so many things hooked right to that because of the magnet. And uh, Mike has these cool little things called, I thought I had one loose here but um, that are called halos and they're little stretchable. Boy, I gotta have one of those to show. Where is it? Anyway, they're little stretchable bands that are on a sticky thing. Here's one. Nope, that one's attached. Anyway, they have a little band around it that you can put anything. And I've got like five of them up on my um, edge here because they don't need a magnet because they stick by themselves and you can put anything in them and they will just conform to that shape. And so those, here we go. I knew if I talked long enough, I was just going to say, if you, if you need, I have a, I got a machine with them on the back here too. Yeah. So Joe's going to split go. screen. Oops. Yep. There you go. So this is this, this little piece you just peel off and it'll stick yeah. to anything. You can see this rotates. So some of my items go in this way and some go this way, but even like you can see those things are not the same size, but this little guy conforms right to that. So it's right up there on that light and that magnet has, and so all my tools that I use all the time are right handy for me to use. And so those are called halos. I think they're $14.99 or something like that for a pack of, a, of 12. And I mean, it was like, a no brainer. These are just awesome. I mean, they just really are. And the thing that's cool about those, if you know a teacher, um, um, even like people who lead um, retreats and things like that, they love these because they can keep their markers on their whiteboard um, handy so they're easy to, to, to find. And so anyway, I'm just telling you these things because I find that when I have my sewing area in order and somewhat organized and have my tools that I need, I have a whole lot more fun when I'm doing my projects. And I don't consider these things ugly. These are just what it take what it takes to, you know, get a stitch out that you did wrong. Don't look at that as I hate that thing because it is really one of your best friends. It allows you to get there and get things out. But if you've got all of that stuff nice and handy, it's just gonna be so much easier to work at your sewing machine. So anyway, I've rambled long enough, Mike. I just uh, love to sew and love to share my love of that. And so um, if there aren't any other questions. No, that's great. And I just wanted to take a moment here just to personally, from Joe and myself personally, uh, just to thank you. I mean, not only, um, I mean, obviously, um, uh, it's our jobs to sell, but you know, more importantly, all of these tools were specifically designed to make your lives easier. I mean, and, and when you're talking about how having the right tools there for the job, uh, it really does make it much, much more enjoyable. And, and I feel that way. And it's really cool because you can hear the passion, uh, as you instruct. 
and uh, you can really tell when people love what they're doing and and it comes through and so i speak for joe and all of the viewers when i say just thank you from the bottom of our hearts for setting aside this two hours um it was an amazing class and i know everyone here really enjoyed it so thank you again thank you yeah, and then